Hi, Trace. Hello. So I'm here with Trace Jordan, a, a distinguished professor at NYU and a scientist. Yes. And also with a, a great experience in education research and development. And uh, uh, this is why I'm, uh, uh, I've been seeing you and knowing you for a number of years. Uh, we meet usually here in this wonderful faculty resource network environment. And uh, so I would like to, to exchange a few ideas on this concept of mix of teaching, learning, etc. Okay. And, uh, but first, I would like to ask you directly, uh, what is this? Uh, you, you're working at NYU as a professor, of course. Right. And then uh, uh, you, you're working with this foundation of scientific inquiry right. uh, in, within the liberal arts concept. Right. Uh, um, it, popped up uh, to me that it's a very interesting uh, uh, thing that, that you're doing. What, what is it all okay. about? So my job is I'm s associate director of our general education curriculum. It's called the Morse Academic Plan. It's named after Samuel Morse, inventor wow. of the Morse Telegraph and the Morse Code. And this program provides the core liberal arts experience for all the undergraduates at um, NYU. So that includes the College of Arts and Science, the Stern School of Business, the School of Education, um, so uh, the, the School of the Arts. So what we do in this program is students take courses in, in a variety of different areas. They take courses in humanities, arts, social sciences, natural sciences, and mathematics. And my job is to um, administer and teach in the Foundations of Scientific Inquiry program, which is a three-course sequence in math and science. So students need to take one course in quantitative reasoning and one course in natural science one, which is the physical sciences, chemistry or physics. One course in natural science two, which is the life sciences, which encompasses biology, um, neuroscience, uh, physical anthropology. And each of these courses is taught in the size of about 120 to 160 students. All the courses have a lab component, and we have dedicated lab rooms and lab staff. And the philosophy of each course is that it is not meant to be a survey. So in that sense, it differs from the introductory course in the major, be it biology or physics or chemistry, which is a survey of a broad range of topics, because then you need to build um, if it's chemistry, organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry. So what our courses do is take one theme that's really a sort of a foundational cutting edge theme in chemistry or physics or biology and we focus on that theme to get students to think about um, what are some of the questions scientists ask, what are some of the interesting problems? What are the methods that they use? What are some of the social and ethical issues that, that sometimes come up? So uh, example is I teach a course called Energy and the Environment, which deals with the chemistry of environmental issues, climate change, ozone depletion, um, renewable energy sources. We have a professor who teaches brain and behavior. And that's to do with the anatomy of the brain, how your brain works, how brain relates to behavior. Other professors teaches lessons from the biosphere, which is all to do with biodiversity and evolution and conservation. So I get to work with a lot of faculty and graduate students in different areas, which makes it very interesting for me. And really, it's training students to be um, scientifically literate. We're not trying to get students to switch into being science majors. We wanted them, when they graduate from NYU, to be able to read a New York Times article or hear something on the news. And, and make sense of it, critically analyze it, say what sounds like good evidence, what doesn't sound reasonable, that this may be new, but it sounds like something I studied in my course. So that's really our goal. So within each of the three areas, students can choose? Uh, students can choose area. between a range of probably about four or five courses, yeah. Wow, you have any computing course within the three areas? We do have a course um, in our quantitative reasoning. Now, it's not a computer course per se, but it's a new course that we have. It's called uh, Quantitative Reasoning, Mathematics, and the Computer. And so mm -hmm. what a professor is taught by a professor named Sam Maritek in computer oh, I, science. I, I knew him. Yes. Um, and he, 
he's trained as a physicist, like many people were in the early days of computer science, and has a long history of, of you know, programming and teaching programming language. So what that course does is it uses Python as the programming language and uses programming to teach mathematical ideas. So the idea is primarily it's a mathematical concepts course, but you're using programming as a tool. So for instance, um, all of our courses deal with probability and statistics to some degree. What Professor Maritek will do is have students write a short routine in Python that, that calculates the number of ways you can sort things. Or um, So the program is used as, as a way of thinking about the mathematical idea. So it's not teaching programming yeah, for the sake of programming, it's teaching programming as a tool to um, understand mathematical ideas. Oh, that seems very, and, and what, what, um, what happened with this, this uh, general education program? I mean, what, what do you feel students are, are, are feeling about the sciences? Well, I mean, we, this program has been around for about 15 years, and I've been here for almost all of those years, and I think we have focused a lot on curriculum development, lab development. We haven't, up until fairly recently, done a systematic evaluation, but we started to do that. Um, partly um, driven by the, the middle states accreditation that's, that's coming up in yeah. a couple of years. So what I have done is designed an assessment tool that's being used in five different courses at the moment and will be scaled up to be used in more courses, which essentially um, looks at students' um, work on the final exam in these courses and divides it into different levels based on Bloom's taxonomy. And um, as you probably know, Bloom's taxonomy is essentially a, a list of um, cognitive um, abilities that go from, from simple to more complex. So the baseline, the, the, the low level would be um, recall and memorization. Um, Middle level would be like an analysis, and then higher level would be like synthesis or application or something like that. So, Bloom's taxonomy has six levels. That that's that was too much for us to, you know, manage in, in a large scale. So so I divided them up into three. So the three basic ones are, like re recall how much can you remember facts, um, explanation how well can you explain a, a scientific phenomenon, and synthesis slash application, which is how much can you apply what you learn to a new situation. And um, we're, we collected this assessment data and, and we're still looking through it. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that has been useful for this, I mean, assessment is something that I think a lot of professors aren't, aren't comfortable with because yeah. one, they feel it's being imposed by above, which it often is. Two, don't really know how to do it or to think about it. Um, but I think that this has been useful because what it highlighted is that many of our courses were only asking questions at the very low level of, of Bloom's taxonomy. So um, professors were, were asking questions that were almost all recall, factual questions. And while you do need some of that, I mean, Bloom's taxonomy sure. doesn't say that you shouldn't ask yeah. recall, but it's, it, you don't want to stay there. And over the years, I've always asked these application questions, you know, here's a quote from the New York Times, what is this telling you, or here's a new scenario. And, and I was a little surprised at how resistant some of the faculty were to that, because they felt that these were students who were not science majors and they couldn't handle it. Um, and my response to that was, well, if you want to, I think we all believe that our goal is to create scientifically literate students, and unless you train them to think about new ideas, then anything that they encounter after the end of your course, they won't be able to figure out. So we're not doing them any favors by if we thinking hold. if all they can do is just memorize things and, and write them back to us, and then, and then we're done. So it was a useful exercise. So uh, you found basically also that um, uh, faculty 
as you say, resistance in a way is a, is a drawback. How, how, how compli com complicated is that? And I'm, I know about the fact that sometimes we feel like things are imposed from mm -hmm. above. Right. And, uh, but uh, what, what do you think is the, the major difficulty of having uh, professors li like us uh, uh, getting involved into, into the new the new, new innovations. New ideas, yeah. I think that's a big, a big issue, and um, I think that uh, it's sort of interesting in, in the field of educational research. And um, you know, some people think, well, if we just publish like more research studies that show that active learning or this type of learning is better than that type of learning, but I honestly don't think that makes too much of a difference by itself because one these are people trained in the sciences so they're not going to go and look at these publications or these journals yeah. um, and secondly it, um, it it's sort of it's sort of alien you know to them so I, I think that the, and so my feeling is always when I work with faculty is is to always I, I think try to understand where they're coming from and, and to appreciate their their constraints because we all we all are constrained. We're all, sure. So first of all, I think everyone feels like too busy. They just feel very overworked with the demands of being a faculty member. They're expected to teach um, at NYU and at many schools. They're expected to do research. Expected to write grants and supervise students. They're expected to you know serve on committees and be on examination committee and so. If I had to say the one thing that professors feel that they're short of is time. So whenever you propose something that is going to be more time on top of their already busy schedule, there's a natural r reluctance yes, I, to do it. Um, I think the other thing also is that many professors are um, potentially open, but they don't know how to go about it because it's not their training. And again, because at the time they're not going to spend, you know, a lot of time sort of reading because they, they have to keep up with their field. So how do you, um, how do you keep up with your professional work in your field in, and and get involved in some of these cutting edge ideas in education? I mean, there are very few people who can do that, like Carl Wyman, who is the Nobel Prize winning physicist who has now switched his attention into doing research yeah, on education after he won the Nobel Prize. Prize. Before then, he probably, he, he could. Probably, yeah. So, and the thing is, is that most professors aren't in that position of luxury. They're, they're, when they're evaluated for tenure or promotion or merit, they count their publications, they count their seminars, they count their grants. And as long as they do an okay job teaching, then that's good enough. So you really, I think, have to um, find a way to get faculty buy-in, and I think a lot of that happens on a on a personal level. I really do think that. Um, I think if you, you know, say, "Hey, that look, this is great research that's been published on active learning in, you know, the Journal of Chemical Education. Take a look." I don't think that's going to have much of an impact, but. Just to give you um, a, an idea about that. Um, so last week there, there were two professors who teach um, the energy and environment course with, with me. So we often offer two sections at the same time. It's a big class, each section has 120 students. So I wanted to make some fair, I wanted to discuss some changes in the course. But the thing is that because there are multiple sections, and because we all need to keep in sync, I can't go off and do something without making sure that everyone buys in. So, example, one of the things was that the course traditionally had one midterm in the middle, and I always felt that that was too late to give students like constructive feedback. So I wanted to put two exams in. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that does involve rearranging the syllabus and rearranging the labs. The other thing was I thought that certain topics in the syllabus could, could be expanded and other topics were probably less important. But again, I can't go off and do it, you know, by myself without getting by. So, you know, I could have held a meeting 
you know, in a conference room and we could have sat up and talked about it. But I just suggested to this faculty members, I said, um, how about I'll take you out to, uh, after work for a beer and we'll talk about the course. And so we went, you know, across to the Apple Bar for a beer. And I honestly thought we would have like one beer, 45 minutes to an hour, and we'd be done. But we were there for like two and a half hours because they really got into it. And we had two beers and we had an appetizer. And, and I think it, it, was, it was because we were outside of the normal element. People were relaxed, you know, it was, mm. it was very open. People shared their honest perspective. Um, and it was me, I think, also going to them and saying, look, I value what you think, you know. I'm, 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 these are my suggestions, but I'm not going to do anything unless you think that they're good ideas. And if you have any ideas, we'll include those as well. So that, that was very valuable. Great. That's, that's, uh, the way to I feel that we as, as, a, uh, as a class of, of, uh, of uh, professors, we sort of have the wish Definitely, to we are very genuinely interested in the, of course, right, in the learning of our students. Let me just see what happened here. Okay, because something I, I, did something. I heard, and perhaps uh, uh, you heard a beep. Yeah, I heard a beep. This today. is recording, and this is the one that is not recording now. Why? I don't know. Let me try again. It's okay. They might be getting strange, strangely full. Uh, so I mean, uh, I, I believe that uh, we we uh, we we do have uh, um, a, a great good faith into our profession, and sometimes the administrative, and sometimes the the, the, the work issues are um, complex. Right. Uh, uh, so, in your case, the uh, the administrative part, the fact that you are uh, the associate director of a general ed component, right. I think that helps into uh, facilitating that students get a little more into the sciences. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, our program does does a, a pretty good job uh, at getting students engaged with science. I mean, a lot of students yeah. walk in. To the first day, and they're a little skeptical because it is a requirement. So many of them wouldn't take a course if they didn't have to. But it is something that I feel that we do um, fairly good job at. Um, I do read all the the course evaluations, and for the most part, they're they're positive. I think the one thing that we've been missing is um, some more direct um, measurement of like what what students are learning, which is what this new assessment. Is will is will aim to do um, because ultimately that's what you you want to show you want to show so that your students the, are learning something. The assessment part in the end will be useful also. It will be useful. I think the process has been useful, exactly. and I think also that the um, uh, the ex hopefully the feedback. You know, we're still looking through it, but yeah, okay. great. And so uh, uh, through your experience as a Professor and as uh, and with your general education component, um, what what do you think are the most uh, usual misconception that people have around teaching learning? And in your case, I'm particularly interested, and this is why I keep on uh, talking about science, uh, because uh, also I would like to know what you think about teaching science in particular. Science to scientists, of course, is a different thing than teaching science to non right. future scientists. But are there uh, particular myths or misconceptions about teaching science, or what do you think about, about that in general? Well, I think the um, tendency is to teach the way that you were taught yourself. And I think most professors don't see a problem with lectures for the most part. 
and I'll tell you why, is because they were lectured to and they learned very well and they were successful because they're professors. So work for them. And you know, the question then becomes, was it the lectures? Was it their own work outside of class? Was it other things as well? But, but the thing is, is that if you have been successful, having been instructed in a particular way, and that's the only thing that you know, then it's fairly logical to assume that that's the technique that you will use. Um, because no one has ever told you differently or shown you differently or you know, persuaded you that, that it's more effective to do something else. So I think that personally, the I mean, there's been a discussion about you know, the end of a lecture for, for a very, very long time. And I don't really see it. I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, what I do think could happen is um, I do think that um, we were talking earlier about new technologies. New technologies could, um, disrupt, could, that. could disrupt that to some degree, but also um, provide other, other avenues. Um, so, for instance, some people, a few people, adventurous people, are experimenting with a sort of flipped classroom model where they'll like, videotape the lectures and then students will watch the lecture you know, segment videotape before class and what like they would do reading and then come to class and have a discussion. But that's, that's very few, it's very few. Um, I think you would have to, you know, and I'm just speaking practically. I mean, if, if, if new technologies and new pedagogies are going to make any impact on a large scale, they would definitely, I think when people have studied change, either at the university level or at the business level or, or other, any levels. There's usually a few pioneers that are, that are you know, and there's a, a certain pioneering group. But what often happens is that that pioneer group sort of saturates, you know, like maybe about 10%, and then the innovation doesn't um, diffuse to the rest of the people. And I, I know that's actually happening with teaching science teaching innovations because I went to a National Science Foundation conference a couple years ago and that's what they said. They, they said they've made big inroads with certain innovators but you know they've saturated mm -hmm. their innovators and what has not happened is those innovations have not diffused or spread into the majority. So I guess that's that's a major question. Why, why has that not happened um, and what would be conditions under which that, that could happen. And what, what do you think in, in that sense? Uh, well, I think, I think it relates to the issues we were discussing earlier. I think that most faculty don't necessarily have time, or they feel they don't have time, to learn these new things. Um, I, it's, it's new. Um, one thing that just popped into my head as we're talking is um, the possibility of doing something like a um, pedagogy, like teaching sabbatical. So the idea would be, so professors take sabbaticals, you know, every once in a while as, as partly a break from, from the, you know, the regular routine, but also so that they can focus on their research or maybe learn a new technique or go in a new direction. Maybe one way to um, increase the the use of these innovations is that you said to a faculty member. I mean, again, you could say um, we'd be willing to give you a one semester sabbatical to learn how to use the flipped classroom, or to learn how to use um, social media for your teaching, and that's what you get your sabbatical for. And at the end, you have to, you know, no. show that you're using it. But the, that, that's the only way I could see it being feasible, because you need time. You need time to absorb it. And I mean, of course, the problem is if you give people sabbaticals, then other people have to cover I mean, but there's, there are possibly ways in which that could be done. So it would be a teaching, a 
te educational sabbatical as opposed to a research sabbatical. Okay, that's a very, very interesting uh, uh, suggestion, actually. So, uh, and also in terms of, uh, of science, what do you what do you see? The the um, you see people around you uh, with prejudices about uh, against about science or or false um, ideas about science. Well, so I mean, I think that many students come into the class with certain preconceived notions about science, and again, these are students who are not science majors, so yeah. science, um, you know, there's many charges that are leveled against science. One that's sort of boring and, and irrelevant to students' lives, that it just simply involves like, memorizing facts and doesn't really, isn't really intellectually engaging. Um, the other is that it's, it's so hard that it's just not you know, something only, you know, some sort of special person with a special type of brain can do. So um, the other thing that we get a lot is sort of a, like a math phobia. Anytime you show numbers, you know, certain portion of students throw up their hands and say that, you know, I don't do math, you know, which is kind of crazy because, you know, it's sort of like, I'm a scientist, like me throwing up my hands. If someone shows me a book, it's like, no, I don't do reading, mm -hmm. you know. But, but you're sort of, you know, saying I don't do math is is socially acceptable. Saying, you know, I don't read, is is not. So I think we have to change the culture to some degree. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it's it's uh, in a, in a way though, um, we as a as a class of teachers and scientists have some responsibility to change that. And I think that's you uh, your, your part into trying at least Absolutely. Uh, a, few, a few avenues to, to, to change that, that model. Right. <laughs> I think so. So um, it's a, a come going back into the, 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 the technologies being sort of disruptive. So I'm interested in what you said before about um, pioneers sort of uh, um, living in a, in a sphere of their own creation and not spreading that. Can we elaborate perhaps a bit more? I mean, how come uh, certain things are a tipping point and then they spread really fast? Right, and, uh, right. That is interesting. Is not right. really happening. It's not really happening. Um, uh, we, perhaps it will happen in a yeah, long yeah, term. Yeah. But, but your, your use of a tipping point is interesting. So the Malcolm Gladwell yeah. book, which I haven't read, but I heard is very good. Um, yeah, so at what point do, uh, at what point does, you know, a tip over and, and these things spread more um, extensively? I'm not sure. We're definitely not there yet. And I think it's partly because, again, partly time, partly people aren't aware of the tools that are available. I think they're also not necessarily aware of what you can do with the tools. Um, and so... Um, they're perhaps wary of the... Of and they're those. probably wary, well, and they're also wary of, of how do you, um, how do you evaluate that? You know, people are comfortable with quizzes and homeworks and exams, but how do you evaluate um, you know blogs or discussion posts um, to, you know what, what what do you do you know do you assign that as part of your grade do you and if so how do you decide what's a good blog post or not a good blog post and who, who gets to read all of them um, so I think there are some practical issues and that's where I think maybe just doing things like some workshops or, or getting you know things that where faculty are talking to other faculty about what they do mm -hmm. and how they okay. how they use a particular tool because I think that's the only way I, again I, I honestly believe that the only successful mechanism for diffusion of innovation is like person to person person to person yeah that's, that's uh, and perhaps that connects also 
uh, in a sense, there's a, a faculty, um, and generally speaking, a university-wide uh, awareness of new technologies. Yeah, it happened thing. with, with the, the new Web 2.0. Right. I remember when sometimes in some places it was forbidden to access Facebook or YouTube. Yeah, or whatever. yeah. And uh, then, but I found, uh, I find it disconcerting in a way that um, this wariness uh, doesn't recognize the needs of students. Because I think that, uh, in a way, we don't, don't, don't you think that we need uh, to have students express more themselves and we should listen a bit more to what students say? Uh, yeah. and think about uh, what, what we teach. Now, I'm not talking only about science. Sure, sure. Um, it's sort of interesting that, that the, um, I would say that the people sort of fall into three general camps based on my experiences. There are, are people who, um, with, with the use of, you know, multimedia and texting and everything like that, you know, electronic devices, there are, at the moment, which is probably the majority, say, I really don't want you to do this, but I'm just sort of not going to deal with it, you know. I'm just going to, you know, look, I'm, I'm teaching and I see students like texting in class and it's sort of annoying because, you know, you feel like you're there to engage in some sort of intellectual conversation and they're sort of tuning out. Um, one response, often taken by humanities people, is like complete ban of any electronic devices in the classroom. Computers, phones, put everything away and focus more on how you would teach a class in, you know, a hundred years ago. Some professors swear by this. Some people say that this has changed the dynamic of their course because it makes students be present. And the problem, I think, with many of the technologies is that in the constant effort to keep up with other people and other things and events, students often are not present at their own experiences. Yeah. Um, so some students swear by that. And, um, or some faculty, I should say. And then the you know the third group, which I think is a much smaller group, and usually people like maybe in the sciences or in education technology or things like that, should say, well, you know, it is what it is. Students are going to be tweeting and they're going to be checking texting and checking Facebook. So let's make that part of the course. Um, so, but again, that's I think a smaller group because they um, you know most people don't know how to do it. So I, I struggle with this myself, to be honest. At the moment, I, I, I'm I sort of in the middle category. Um, I, I don't particularly, I, I do let students use laptops, you know, because if they're taking notes, and a lot of times I'll post PowerPoint slides and they'll annotate them. So it doesn't make sense to, to say, like, no computers. Um, on the other hand, I really like it when students are in the back row, you know, texting the whole class. So I'm, I'm sort of torn at the moment, and I think that um, I'm going to have to find some other sort of creative ways to, to, um, use, to use technology. Uh, the other thing also that um, I heard a talk from somebody, um, I think maybe at our technology conference, who is sort of a big believer in... in trying to st strike some middle ground, which is, I, I, th I think it's probably the best, which is that there are some times when you really want students to be present in the moment and not be distracted by the technology, and there are some times when, you know, maybe using the technology is, is, really is a fine thing. So what he's, he says is that the way he often teaches is that you will have computers and often students will be working on like either independent projects or looking up things. But then he has a he has what he called lids down, which I thought was a nice phrase. Where so basically what he says is you go, okay, everybody close your computer. Everybody just be present in the moment and let's debrief or let's talk. So I, I'm gonna say again, I'm I'm struggling with this myself. I don't have an easy answer. I'm not 
I'm not really on the cutting edge with using new technologies, um, but I'm also not of the, the camp that says, let's just you know, ban them and pretend they don't exist, because I don't think that's feasible. So I need to find my own way at the moment still. I, I love the way you said, particularly, students need to be present. And I think that's the, the focus of our, of our uh, must be the focus of our attention. I think that they can be present, perhaps, as, as you say, uh, using the technology as yeah. well as not using Sure, them. they can be. They and can, I'm, right. I'm very intrigued by the fact that um, if you go to a conference, uh, a scientific academic conference, you will right. find everybody tweeting and, and uh, right. texting, texting, and yeah, doing yeah. paper presentations, sure, sure. keynotes. And that's a, way, a human way to share yeah, also, yeah. so I find sure. it uh, intriguing sure. to, sure. and perhaps hasn't that something to do with the fact that when I uh, take part into a paper presentation, I, there's not the, the assumption that I will be learning during that presentation, while if a student stays in the class with me, right. there is right. this Sort right. of yeah. Damocles. Uh, yeah, yeah. The sword Damocles. hanging over your head. Yeah. No, I think that's part of it. I mean, professors, to be honest, are just as, just as bad. You know, I'm I'm very very, conscious of. I mean, I only got a smartphone as a Christmas present this past <laughs> Christmas because I resisted it because I figured, look, spend enough time on my email. I I don't. But I I definitely found it very useful. But I I am honestly. I never, I would never, you know, get it out during meetings or things like that, you know, because I, I personally think it's an, it's an issue of respect of somebody. If you're with somebody and somebody's talking, I think it's sort of disrespectful. But then again, students don't think that, so that, that doesn't really quite work with them. But, uh, sorry, in a way, we also have the duty to, to I wouldn't say teach, but at least to show students what is the model yeah. of ethics yeah. of okay. behavior. And, that I, and I think that's a good that's for, a good you know? point, and that's a good point. And I think that what you can do, rather than just sort of getting annoyed with it, you can just say that look, this is, you know, a, a certain standard of discourse. And I try I say this to my students. I don't know, like if you came to my office and you started talking to me, and I got off my phone, got up my phone and started texting, you you'd probably be offended and and frustrated. So. But it, I don't know if it works, to be perfectly honest. Um, no, no, you can do things. I mean, and I've seen that some people say that, that you can use your phones to do like online polls. So you can oh, put up a question yeah. and you can say, um, I don't know, what's instant this answer? Polling. You know, instant polling, things like that. I haven't, haven't really explored. I mean, again, this is the irony because I'm, I'm the one who's trying to help my program stay on the cutting edge and I, I don't have time exactly. to look at to huge, look at many of these huge, things huge. because yeah. it's like yeah. when's that gonna you know I have to do this I have to write a like read a recommendation I have to go to five meetings so and do I have time to do it so um, the, the thing that we need to find is time to reflect it's time to reflect and time to learn new learn. things yes. and that's where I do believe things things like the FRN scholar in residence you know, like is is very useful, oh, and true. so I don't know. So maybe that's I think I think if if we're trying to think of mechanisms for innovation or spread of innovation, I think one is definitely addressing the challenge of time and not. I think in getting away from this model of just thinking of faculty as being uh, sort of resistant to change for change's sake. I don't think most mm -hmm. of them are. Yeah. I think most of them are just overworked. Yes. And they just don't feel they, they have the time or energy to take on something else above and beyond their already yes. busy commitments. So one of my jobs in our program is to try and make that as, as easy as possible. So, so for instance, um, this coming fall, um, or during the coming year, we're gonna be transitioning our course management system from Blackboard, which we've had for quite a long time, to this new open source Sakai oh. system. So I've signed up in the fall 
to be a pilot user of, of this new Sakai system. So I can experience it. I can figure out what the, what the, the glitches are, what the good points are, so that when professors, when, when they transition the whole university, which will be in the spring, so it's fairly soon, I will be able to contribute something. I'll say, ah, you know, yeah, I had trouble with this too, but you know, click on this and do that, or this button isn't obvious and it's hidden here. So again, the more the more I can I can facilitate that, you know, with faculty and, and maybe with new technologies. Um, I'm gonna try with with the Sakai, I'm gonna try and use the discussion board more extensively this um, coming fall. Starting in the fall. Yeah, starting in the fall. And I haven't done that much. But and the other thing I also think is and I was talking about this today with my colleague Neville Kalbach. Um, he was talking about some new ideas. Is that I also do feel that, given the fact that we're busy, and given the fact that we have other responsibilities, and given the fact that professors don't like to be in a position where they don't know what they're doing, it makes mm -hmm. us uncomfortable because we, we're like, is just to do a little bit at a time. Um, because sometimes to make huge changes can seem overwhelming in terms of, but you know, maybe this semester do an online discussion board. Um, and that's it. See how that goes. Exactly. Maybe the next semester you keep the online discussion board, but you do in class polling using polling. So take it take it in bite sized chunks so that each thing doesn't become so unmanageable and overwhelming. So I think that's um, I think that's a good strategy. I think that, yeah, and that's a great uh, suggestion and, and reflection also. So I would think that I won't uh, abuse your time. <laughs> and um, it's been really very interesting. And I think you, you gave me and, and us generally uh, a, a solid uh, reflection moment on many, many issues. And uh, I thank you very Good. much. Good. Well, I enjoyed it very much. Really, I think that that, as you say, I agree really, to, to really have a widespread innovation in education. We need to reflect on a few things. Sure. And perhaps also as a, as a concluding remark, uh, shouldn't we really, I mean, sometimes we say to ourselves that we are slow in universities right. to accept innovation. Itself. Right. Sometimes do I ask myself, isn't it also a good thing that we tend to reflect for a long time? Perhaps. I mean, that's not a bad, well, too yeah. long sometimes, but that's not necessarily, so maybe that's, I think what universities do is um, they have, you know, people who are smart, thoughtful people who need to be convinced before they do something, and maybe that's, that's not a bad thing. Maybe the idea is that, you know, there, there are certain waves that, that come and go, but maybe this reflective, you know, maybe it is taking longer than it should, but maybe this reflective process is not such a bad thing. Okay, well, good. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're great. most welcome, and good luck with the rest of your projects. Thanks, thanks. I, I, I will keep you posted. I Please do, do appreciate. Well, it... It's all okay? Yeah, I think Excellent. this at least 